Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. After sacrificing his own freedom to fight segregation in Alabama, Dr. Martin Luther King penned the following words from a jail cell. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This was in response to a letter written by a local clergyman who called King an outside agitator without personal stake in the Jim Crow laws that existed in the city that he did not live in. Dr. King felt that justice was universal and freedom could not exist when there are different laws set for people based upon the whims of the state. It's the same thinking that informs the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states in part in Article 23, everyone has the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of his interests. This document makes no distinction between private sector employees or public sector employees. After the entire world had witnessed the abuses on personal liberty during World War II, the leaders of the world agreed that there are rights that are universal and that a threat to justice anywhere should be addressed before this injustice could be spread elsewhere. Even in our own Constitution, it supports these basic tenets by granting all the people the right to free speech and the right to assemble, which form the bedrock of collective bargaining. However, Collective bargaining must be maintained in the public sector not only because it is a fundamental right, but also because it gives public employees the space to advocate for the people they serve and to keep these essential public services public. Individuals have the right to enter the contracts that are protected by the state. Why would we change the rules when a group of people with a common interest, a union, combines efforts to advocate for themselves? The ability to organize and collectively bargain places a check on the overwhelming power of a corporation or, for the sake of today's debates, the state. To take away a right afforded by some, afforded to some, is dangerous, and history has shown that doing so, based on a seductive ideology, can have devastating effects. These effects were the catalyst for King's activism and the UN Treatise on Human Rights. Now, a loaf of bread costs no less for a public, server, public service worker than for its private counterpart. Why should they be granted different rights in advocating for their wages? Now, union contracts don't just fall from the sky. Workers organizing a union and management are both tasked with reconciling an agreement both sides can accept based on economic, political, and social reality. Many opponents of public sector collective bargaining use rhetoric to place a firewall between employee and the taxpayer as if the two are playing some zero-sum game with public funds. However, union members have just as much at stake in a fiscally responsible contract because we are taxpayers. Pitting public sector workers against the citizen is a false division used to elicit an emotional response from the public during this time of economic crisis. This is both disingenuous and has dangerous policy implications. Public workers work directly with the public and are the first to hear the grievances and see the effects of policies and how they affect their services. Collective bargaining gives them the space to advocate for the clients without fear of losing their own jobs. Now, for example, we see this in teachers' unions that have advocated for smaller class sizes for their students. Studies like the Tennessee Class Size Project show that, no doubt, small classes have an advantage over larger classes in reading and math in early primary grades. The re results of this study show a material need for students to have smaller class sizes. However, the Illinois General Assembly in 1995 moved class sizes to be, a ro prohibited, be prohibited from collective bargaining. <clears throat> Teachers became voiceless when their class sizes swelled and learning conditions began to deteriorate. Now, they voiced their concerns to their union leadership, who worked with lawmakers to redesignate class size as a permissive issue of bargaining. 
and this allowed the teachers union to define a procedure in its contract for teachers to report larger class sizes than the recommended size without fear of retaliation from their principal. Now some may argue that this advocacy means that the teacher is fighting for a reduced workload. But what taxpaying parent wouldn't want their child to learn with a class size that is, that is recommended by research and advocated by someone who works directly with their child? What parent wants to entrust decisions about quality of education to elected officials who are not present in the classroom and do not see the implications of the laws they pass? Public sector collective bargaining allows workers to advocate and keep these public services public as well. These are services that are simply too important to be left in the hands of profit seekers. The reason these services migrated to the public sector in the first place is that profit motive shifts the least possible care for the most profit. Now we learned the problem of privatizing essential services early in our nation's history when firefighting was a privatizing endeavor underwritten by insurance companies. Firefighters could only put out fires for homeowners who paid for the right to hang their company's emblem on their house. If you had a competing fire department's emblem on your house, the firefighters would have to watch your house burn down. This was devastating for these firefighters who chose the dangerous work to simply help out their fellow man. Now the public did not want to capture the same situation with food safety inspection, parks, or their roads. The workers who staff these services want to serve our communities because they are not driven by profit, but driven by a need to serve the community. Just about every public service job exists in the private sector as well. Public workers forego higher wages that they would earn in the private sector because they choose to serve. If profit motivated everyone, wouldn't these people simply take on a role in the private sector? Why would anyone be an attorney for a municipal government if they could make tens of thousands more at a private firm? Public sector unions, um, before public sector unions, public service had moved to become a patronage system. Some union busters might argue that unions give a job for life, but this is false based upon the facts. However, political patronage can lead to a job for life for the well-connected regardless of their effectiveness on the job. Public sector unions fought to make these jobs open to every qualified individual regardless of gender, race, or political affiliation. They also fought to professionalize these careers, keeping many from turning to low-wage, high-turnover jobs. Do we want to live in a world where the people who inspect the safety of our buildings, teach our children, or work with families in crisis have under two years of experience because they had to leave public service to raise a family? The ability to advocate for proper working conditions allows public servants the ability to gain experience and become better at their jobs. In conclusion, public workers have the fundamental right to organize and advocate for themselves in the services that they provide. We need public sector unions to defend these services and keep them public because the alternative would attract profit seekers looking to exploit the very service that the public demands. Thank you very much.